Hello. Welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of sales strategy. This is a sales training presentation developed with the sales professional in mind. It's important to note that the content of my presentation can be varied based on the skill level of the sales professionals in the audience. For example, for new sales professionals, we might want to cover a lot of the fundamentals, things such as identifying decision makers, isolating objections, hunting versus farming. However, for more advanced, experienced audiences, we might want to skip the basics and go straight to the real world applications and lessons learned. Now I want to use that latter point to describe a little bit of what I'm going to do in the sample here. I will be skipping over some of the basics because I think you'll find that there are quite a few options that you have for that kind of training and hopefully it's consistent. So I'm going to cover some more, I think, advanced areas to give you a better feel for how I'm differentiated from some of your other options. So with that in mind, let's get started. I usually start off my sales strategy presentation with a discussion of the importance of sales to an organization and to the business. And I am unapologetic about telling you this is typically a pep talk. Uh, as we all know, sales can be a challenging profession. You have to handle rejection with a great deal of uh, resilience. You have to deal with a lot of different personalities. And so I think it's important to start off a sales presentation with a, with a reminder of how important what we do actually is. And this is a, especially important since many of the occasions that I speak at are retreats where the group is there to recharge their batteries. And there's usually a couple of points that I like to make here. Um, the first example I'll give you is that if you look at most business functional areas like a, a manufacturing or an engineering, a, a service delivery, a finance, there's a lot of emphasis placed on repeatability. They want consistent products and processes and to do that they want to use interchangeable parts and equipment and materials. However, in sales, our materials, the, the things that we work with, are people. And the fact of the matter is people aren't interchangeable. And that places a really high bar on us as sales professionals because we have to deal with a high level of variability in that which we do every day, day in, day out. And that is both a, a, a large challenge and it takes a special person to be able to handle that. The second point I want to make is it's always been fascinating to me how neglected as an area of business study sales can be. I'll give you an example from my own experience. I have my MBA from the Harvard Business School and I oftentimes tout that when I'm promoting my services. I don't think I'm entitled to anything because of my pedigree. It's just a, just a good brand to mention. But the irony when I'm talking about the subject of sales strategy is I didn't learn any of this at Harvard. The truth is they don't teach it there nor do they teach it at any of the other major business schools where I looked at the curriculum. And so this is really, uh, this, is, this is a couple of points. I have some theories as to why that is that I get into in the live presentation, but I think the real takeaway is that oftentimes when you're a sales professional, you can get the feeling that there are some people maybe in your own organization who don't understand what you do. Sometimes they might not even value what you do. That's especially true of organizations where the senior leadership isn't drawn from the sales rank. And I think this helps us to understand why that is. It's not because what we do isn't important. It's because those people may not have been taught the skills or the importance of what we do and it's up to us to demonstrate that. So with that preface in mind, I usually get into some of the more active topics like negotiation. And I'm specifically interested in talking about the difference between creating value and capturing value. This can be growing the pie, if you wish to think of it that way, and determining the size of your slice. And I am really fascinated here with the role of information exchange during a negotiation. Now, I will, I will say that if you want to Get, if, if you're interested in getting something out of a negotiation, there's a value in sharing that with the person on the other side of the table because you might be able to get it and find a way to create value. However, by sharing that same information, you also tell them that it's important to you and they might want to charge you more for that in terms of money or whatever currency is the, the uh, whatever the currency of your negotiation happens to be. And so there's a real duality there with information and sharing information. And this is where the academic models usually come in. And I show a couple of those. Uh, I talk about things like Pareto efficiency, show this graphically a little bit. Uh, but that's also where most of the academic and economic models tend to stop. And I like to go to the next level, which I think is particularly important to sales professionals. That is perception. Most 
academics will take those values at, at, under the assumption that they are demonstrated and understood. And the reality is we as sales professionals have the ability to impact that perception. And that gets back to what I was talking about, how sometimes the academic realm doesn't really understand the role of sales. And I'll give you an example of this. I, I, I describe this as reframing because it depends on how it's, it, 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 the value is based on how you frame the, the sharing of information with your, with your other party. I was working on a federal grant and they were going to, uh, on behalf of a client, and they were going to announce who had been awarded these grants in several rounds. And the first round came out and our, our grant, our client was not included. And my partner and I were sort of hesitant to call them up because we were worried that we were gonna have to tell them that they hadn't been accepted yet. And the partner at this firm, who's a, an excellent sales professional himself said, look, you've got this wrong. You're not calling them to tell them they didn't get in the first round. You're calling them to say, great news, they've started to announce. And you'll notice that by a subtle reframing of the position, he made that into a positive value. And I particularly like that example because it shows you don't have to do anything deceptive or, or duplicitous. That's, that's an accurate statement. That is a, a per per perfectly reasonable way of framing that, reasonable way of looking at it. And uh, it, 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 it adds much more than, than what, what we were going to originally go with. So that's a bit on negotiation. I'll also let you know I have a dedicated presentation on negoti negotiation. This is just a sample that I usually include in the uh, sales strategy, an abbreviated form, if you will, because I think it's so important to what sales professionals do. The next topic I usually move on to is <clears throat> integrity. This is an important thing, I think, to include in just about every presentation on sales and maybe even business in general. The, you usually, when you hire a speaker, get someone who has a story about how there was a, a, a situation where there was a, somebody was doing something wrong and a good person wanted to fix it and at the end of the day it got fixed and the good person was rewarded and the evildoer was punished. And it's a very simple, uh, straightforward view of the world. This is what's called the just world hypothesis. It's the assumption that virtue will always be rewarded and vice will always suffer in the long run. Uh, I, I'm not really sure that that is uh, a, a holistic view. I say I don't think that's incorrect. I definitely agree that that happens. It might be incomplete. And that's a debatable point. And so what I do is I talk about the assumptions that you have to believe to accept this view of the world. And I really let the audience decide for themselves whether or not that's, a, that's an absolute uh, truth, an absolute view. The second point I usually talk about, the second school of thought, and this is sort of the opposite, that's the everybody knows or the poker analogy or the buyer beware <clears throat> school of thought. And what it says is, look, we're all in these business negotiations and in these business interactions, these sales interactions to promote our own economic well-being. We all understand that and therefore we all understand that behavior that could be deceptive or duplicitous is to be expected and they should realize it. Now I am openly very skeptical of that view. I talk about it, but I also uh, point off a lot of evidence that I don't think people really subscribe to that view. I think a lot of people use it to justify their behavior, but I also talk about the assumptions that underlie that school of thought, what you have to believe, and you'll find that most people will actually act in ways that are inconsistent, even those who, who say that that's, that's what defines them. And lastly, for this sample, I want to talk about some of the different tests you can apply to determine whether what you're doing is consistent with your own sense of integrity and your organization's sense of integrity. Those tests can include, I'll list a couple here, the sunshine test, the reciprocity test, the trusted friend or family member test. And I get into what those are in the live presentation. Let's move on to some other subjects. I like to talk a lot about adaptability. And if you look at it, I think all sales professionals that you ask, is it good to be adaptable? They'll say yes. But it's surprising how, how that isn't always the way we act, even though we might intellectually understand that that's important. And what I talk about is oftentimes we end up in patterns of behavior. behavior. We adopt a certain persona. We, we learn a certain procedure for our sales calls, a certain manner to our pitch. And what happens is we usually get that from either training, either formally, from the company or sometimes on the job. We look at what our peers are doing. We also do it through trial and error and we adopt a pattern based on what works. And sometimes it's something that our boss tells us, this is how we do it here. And then what tends to happen over time is that that gets reinforced. This through a combination of success and reward, 
uh, in, in integration with our own personal psycho-egotistical reasons that we, we start to pride ourselves on doing things this way and being good at doing it this way. We get very good at that, pat very effective with that pattern of behavior. And my concern is, even if that's valid, it, it, by subscribing to a specific pattern of behavior and by failing to be adaptable outside of that, there are two costs. The first cost is the cost in your current position. If you, ha if you have learned that this is a pattern of behavior that is effective with most customers and other customers it doesn't work with, you might start to describe those other customers as non-buyers. The reality is it might be a different pattern of behavior that is effective with them. And so by learning different pitches for different audiences, you might actually be able to improve your results. The second reason is it tends to fix you professionally. It makes it very difficult for you to grow into other jobs, other industries, or maybe up the value chain at your organization. You're, you want to start taking larger, more professional clients, but you've been sort of, you've been successful with a certain pattern of behavior, and you've become to pride yourself on being good at that pattern, and that will inhibit you from changing outside of it. The second element of adaptability I want to bring up in this sample is the importance of what I call the mediator model. You could also think of this as the arbitrator model. Oftentimes we think of ourselves as an advocate for our organization to the client. And that can be a very one-sided view of things. Other, other times we might actually reverse that and we start to think of ourselves as the advocate for the client to our organization. And we're wondering why it's always hard for them to change, change what they want for, on behalf of the client. And either one of these taken in isolation can be very limiting. I, I recommend one of, the, one of the most important things as a sales professional is to start to think of yourself as a mediator. Your job is to bring your clients together with what's important to your organization and create a win-win. Now sometimes executives get a little defensive about this. What do you mean? You're, they're, they're, they're trying to convince me to change my way? They're supposed to be acting on my behalf. Relax. It's not a bad thing. It's essentially free customer advice. Your sales force is bringing to you the needs of the customer. So, so if you think of yourself as a mediator, it might open yourself up to some opportunities, get you to think a little bit more creatively about ways to bring the deals together. I'll close out my sample here with the subject of building trust. And I want to give some advice on how uh, it's been proven that, that trust has been built over time. The first one is, if you want to be perceived as trustworthy, act in a trustworthy manner. And by that I mean take it seriously. Now I recognize that sounds trite. But in reality, even if we would all agree that yes, that sounds like a good way to do it, oftentimes we fail to do so. And I describe a phenomenon that I refer to as, peop uh, as people perceiving a lack of trust as a perceptual problem rather than a behavioral problem. And if you really want to build trust, behavior is a more effective means. I'll give you an example. There was an investment bank during the credit crunch, and they were rather embarrassed when they some of their emails were made public that demonstrated they were selling their clients who they were supposed to be advocating products that they referred to as such low quality they would use profanity and so they were clearly not taking their clients best interests to heart and the bank's response to that was to pass a rule that outlawed profanity in email now to me that's a group that doesn't get it you'll notice they didn't outlaw selling bad products to their clients they didn't fire those individuals. They just made it so that it wouldn't be embarrassing if it came out. And that's what I talk about when I say they thought they had a perception problem and what they had was a behavioral problem. The last thing I want to talk about here for this sample is that uh, studies have shown that if, if you like to build trust, one of the best ways to do that is to act counter to stereotype. If there are industry standards industry standard patterns of behavior among the sales force, acting counter to that will cause your clients, your customers to take you more seriously and, and, and take, uh, take what you have to say to heart more readily. And that's uh, backed up through a, a, lot of, a lot of research there. Now this can be a little tricky because sometimes your management might have some expectations about how, the, how you're supposed to act in this industry. I personally had this experience. I had a a, uh, a real straight from central casting aggressive sales vice president and he was all he liked to see a lot of energy and a lot of aggressiveness and I had clients who really who were sick and tired of that and really preferred a, a more 
uh, a more subdued uh, cerebral approach. And so I had to be a different, effectively a different person with one versus the other. That worked really well for me unless I had them both in the same room. That got a little trickier. I had to, had to, had to juggle a little bit there. But anyway, those are some of the examples for what I like to include in my sales training presentation, my sales strategy as I call it. I hope you found this of interest. If it looks like something you might be interested in having conducted at your organization or your event, please contact me for a proposal. I'd be happy to prepare it for you. And I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.